Amen. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Adarian. Well, Easter has really crept up on us this year. Uh, I was a little bit shocked when I found out that it's next week. Um, and doesn't it just feel like 100 years ago that people were talking about Lent? It's, it's hard to believe it's the same year. And people talking about what should I give up for Lent? Will it be chocolate? Uh, that seems to be a perennial favourite. Of course, for most of us, it turned out to be toilet paper this year. <laughs> well, and so everything's changed. And instead of the usual preaching calendar, we're in this strange situation where we don't quite know week to week um, uh, how to deal with our program. We, you, you remember, we were supposed to be preaching our way through the life of David. And we do plan to pick that up again sometime after Easter. But at the moment, we're very focused on uh, what can be said about the current situation. Um, and even the business of preaching now is very strange. It's very different from usual. So Normally, I, I love to see all your happy, smiling faces out there in the congregation and sort of understand who's who's getting what and, and how it's all progressing. So I've got a little bit of help this morning. I'm, I'm talking only to a camera, but uh, Fiona and Dan and Beth uh, are, are sitting opposite me in little chairs. And in fact, let's just show you how they are. So uh, can you see them there? So they're sharing a blanket as well. Yeah, they've got a blanket covering their knees because it's so cold in this house. But they're my congregation, so I have someone to look at while all this is going on. So that's a pleasant bonus. But so with all that cheerfulness uh, established, now I want to tell you this. I want to talk about facing death. And my title today is Long Life and Eternal Life. But to think about those things, we do have to think about death as well. So what we're going to do is look at some people in the Bible who face death. Some of them lived, some of them died, and we're going to see what we can learn from them. Uh, and particularly now as we're coming up to Easter, when we think about Jesus having been raised from the dead and everything that that means for us. I want to prepare really for Easter by looking at people in the Bible who saw beyond death, or you could equally say who saw beyond this life. So we're going to begin then with the story of Daniel's three friends that Beth read to us. Uh, the names are strange and ancient, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm just going to call them Daniel's friends. Uh, the king is called Nebuchadnezzar. That's a strange name. I'm just going to call him the king. Um, but you'll remember the key thing here is the king required everybody to worship an image of him. And if they didn't, they would be thrown into this furnace. And all of Daniel's three friends refused. So I'm just going to read again the very end of that passage. Uh, then the king flew into a rage and ordered that the three friends be brought before him. And when they were brought in, the king said to them, is it true that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? If you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? And they replied, O king, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the statue you have set up. Now, the key point I want to make here is not that God was able to save them from the furnace. Uh, and it's not even that God did save them from the furnace. In fact, we didn't even read how this story ends. Uh, and do go and read it yourself afterwards. Uh, Daniel chapter three, starting at verse 19, and you'll see that they survived the furnace. But the key point to me here is not that God could keep them so through the furnace. Their true hope was in this. What they said was, even if he doesn't, we will never worship your statue. And it's that even if he doesn't that fascinates me. That's the bit when I read this that leaps out at me. Now, these are Jews living hundreds of years before the time of Christ. There's nothing written down in, in what they would have had by way of a Bible, the, the early books of the Old Testament, uh, that would have told them really very clearly that there is another life waiting for them after this one. And yet clearly they saw that. They saw that that was there waiting for them, because if they hadn't seen that, they would never have thrown away the lives that they were living there and then. If that was the only life they had, they would have clung on to it, wouldn't they? But instead, they were able to say, even if God doesn't bring us safely through the furnace, what they were saying essentially is, we still trust him for the life that comes after this. 
So what happened here is they saw that their eternal destiny was with God. Daniel's three friends faced death and they looked past it. So as it happens, God saved them from the furnace. But to me, that isn't even really the main point of that story. In fact, if they had died in the furnace, that wouldn't really have changed the focus of what this is about. So let's look now at some people in the Bible who did actually die. But it's a very special category of people who died. It's the ones who were raised from the dead. Now, obviously, when we think about resurrection in the Bible, we think, first of all, about Jesus. And absolutely rightly, and Tim will talk far more, uh, I think, about the, the resurrection of Christ next week. But there are eight other stories in the Bible of people who, having died, were raised to life again. Three of them in the Old Testament. Um, uh, the prophets Elijah and Elisha uh, raised different people from the dead. And then in the New Testament, three people that Jesus raised. And of course, the, the best known of those is Lazarus, uh, a name that really has become synonymous with the idea of returning from the dead. And two others who, after Jesus had ascended, uh, the apostles prayed for, and they were raised also from the dead. So we won't go into who they all were. We won't look at the individual stories. You can just think of Lazarus as an example of all of them, if you like, standing in for them all. But the question I want to ask is this. What happened next? Well, I think we can assume that 30 or 50 or 70 years later, what happened to Lazarus was he died. So the same will have been true with all of these people, the, the, the various sons of widows that the Old Testament prophets raised to life. They will have lived for some decades and then died. Just as all of us will do. Now, what happened to them, of course, was fantastic and miraculous. And I'm not at all talking those miracles down. But ultimately, all they got out of that was a few more decades of the life that they were already living. You could say it's almost the same thing as, as what the king offered Daniel's three friends. You know, because he had the power in that position to say, I'm going to have you killed now. But if you do what I want, I'm going to let you live for your 30 or 50 or 70 years. Or you could look at it another way and say, well, it's the same thing that a good human healthcare system can give us now. That people who become ill, who have a serious illness that might kill them, they get the right health care. Uh, it can give them another 30 or 50 or 70 years of life. Now, that is a fantastic thing. It's, it's a brilliant thing. Don't mishear me. But it's only about getting a little more or a lot more of what we already have this life. But Daniel's three friends saw something beyond that, didn't they? They weren't just looking at, can we survive the furnace? Can we carry on living after we've thrown into the furnace? They were saying, even if the furnace kills us, we see further, we see beyond. And so I want to come to the third person, the last person really that we're looking at today, uh, because we've looked at people who died and were raised to have more life on earth. And we've looked at Daniel's friends who escaped death, but who didn't fear it anyway, because they saw further. Now I want to look at somebody who did die and who wasn't raised, but who in some ways is the best example for us. Um, and I suppose because the situations we talked about before are rare. You know, Daniel's friends who survived the furnace, that was a miracle. Those eight people in the Bible who, having died, were raised to more life on earth, they're very rare. But all of us, unless something astonishing happens, will die. So let's look at someone who died in the Bible. Now we're coming in near the end of Luke's gospel here, chapter 23, and I'm going to start reading from verse 32. Two others, both of them criminals, were led out to be executed with Jesus. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed Jesus to the cross and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Well, prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, we're just going to look at the second thief here. His body was broken. Even if he'd been taken down from the cross at that point, he couldn't have survived. All his hope for earthly life was gone. He wasn't like somebody now who gets an illness and goes into a hospital hoping to recover from the illness and live another 30 or 40 or 50 years. His life was over and he knew it. All his hope in earthly life was gone. And yet in that situation, he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, what does that tell us about his perspective? Now, his hope was not in this world at all, but in eternity. He was looking beyond the world that we live in now to something higher and above. Not only that, it's an astonishing thing. I, I think apart from Jesus himself, this thief is the only person in the Bible who we know for certain is in heaven. Now, obviously, we can guess with very good confidence that Peter and Paul and David and Abraham and all the rest uh, make it there. But this thief is the only person to whom we have we hear Jesus actually saying, today you will be with me in paradise. So the thief died, but he was raised to eternal life. Now you see how he is looking at something far greater than even Lazarus received, who was just raised up to more of this life. So what about us then? Where do we stand? How do we compare ourselves with these people? How did their positions inform ours? Now, I hope every one of us who's a Christian would say that we trust God in the midst of the coronavirus crisis. But the question I want to ask is, what exactly is our hope in? Now, there are two things that are quite different from each other. One is that we can trust that God will keep us safe through the coronavirus. Now, I'm not saying at all that that's a bad thing absolutely it's good to, to pray for safety uh, and of course we also have our part to play in keeping ourselves and others safe uh, and again the social distancing measures that everybody talks about uh, and the hand washing and everything else they remain incredibly important please absolutely stay with those but there's another perspective as well isn't there that daniel's friends had the right perspective when they said but even if he doesn't keep us safe through the furnace or in our case we could say even if god doesn't keep us safe through the coronavirus it's still the case that we look beyond this life and we look at what god has for us beyond here so what are we looking for when we say that we trust god in this situation we're not just looking to survive this and live for a few more decades on the earth like lazarus did we are looking for eternity like the thief we're not just saying that God can save us from dying. We're saying that even if we die, God will save us. So important. So valuable. So we think about how we've responded so far to the coronavirus crisis. In some ways, you could say it's brought out the best in this church. I mean, I think it's great that uh, you remember from last week, we saw the photos of how Lynn and her team have been providing food for the school kids. Uh, I'm impressed that the church has done such a good job of keeping in touch with its members and reaching out to people and providing a sense of community. All of this is great. And I love that we do it. And there's part of me that sort of imagines non-Christians looking at what the church is doing and maybe being quite impressed by it. And I think, oh, that's good. You know, we're, we're glad that it's that way. But I would never want us for that reason to get sort of drawn into thinking of ourselves just as a charitable society as an organization that's out to do good to people. That's valuable, but we're more than that. We are the church. Our hope, our goal is not just to prolong life, not just to give people a better life here on earth. In fact, it's not even, our hope isn't even in God's ability to prolong our lives and give us more life on earth and a better quality of life on earth. It's more than that, isn't it? It's the eternal life that God has promised us. And by eternal, I believe the Bible doesn't just mean going on forever. It's talking about a different quality of life. And this is so important that Paul, in his first letters to the Corinthians, writes this. 
if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Now, Paul could have said, uh, even if the, there's no life to come after this, it's still best to be a Christian because it gives you a clearer perspective on life and good principles for living and a healthier family and all kinds of other things that we might say as well about the side effects, the, the sort of fringe benefits of being a Christian. But actually, Paul sees this laser kind of focus that if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we're to be pitied because for him, the recognition of the life to come was so very much more important. And I think that's crucial. It's really easy for us to misunderstand, I think, what this world is and what God has promised us. You know, this remember, this world is just a creation. It's just a thing that God made. Like you or I might make a, a Lego model or a, a cake or something. And yet the reality of the person who makes the Lego model or makes the cake is so very much greater than the reality of the cake or the Lego model. And in the same way, this entire physical universe that we live in, the whole universe of space and time, really is a trivial thing in comparison with the person who made it and the life that he offers us. More than that, the life that he has promised us is so much greater than the life that we can have in this physical universe. Now, we can't understand what heaven will be like. We could, it just doesn't fit into our minds. You know, it's as far above the life we have now as our life is above the life of an ant or something. If you try to explain it to an ant, you get nowhere. But we need to grasp that what God promises us is not just more life of the same kind that we already have, but something completely different. And, you know, all our metaphors fail us. We can't really describe what this will be like. But there's one thing that maybe will help a little is to imagine a drawing on the page of a book. And then if you were to promise that drawing life, then maybe what we would mean is, well, on the next page of the book, there's another drawing of the same figure or that, that there are more stories to be told about that life. But what we're dealing with here is something very different in character. It's more like inviting the drawing to step out of the pages of the book into reality, to live a real three-dimensional life. Now, again, this is only a picture. It's not necessarily a very good picture, but something a little bit like that is coming for us when we step out of the pages of this physical universe we're in now and land up somewhere so very, very much better, not just better, but more real. I don't know how many of you have seen the TV show, The Good Place. It's been uh, on the last couple of years. It's a rather good comedy. Uh, about people who die and find themselves in some kind of conception of heaven. Uh, and one of the things about that program that, that's fascinating to me is how weak their idea is of what heaven can be. Uh, it's essentially, it's just here, but better. So it's, it's like a, a town that you would live in now, but the sun is always shining um, and the food is better and people are nicer. And, and what happens is a bit of a spoiler for the show, but there comes a point later on in the show where people who've lived there for thousands of years just become bored of the whole thing and want to end their lives. Now, that shows how weak our conception of what heaven is can be. That we can only really think of it as being more of the life that we have. But what we're promised is so very much higher, so very much greater, not just in degree but in quality. You know, if the greatest scientist who's in heaven were to come down to us and explain it in technical detail, and next to him, the greatest poet in heaven came down and tried to expound it to us in ways that spoke to our heart, even still, we wouldn't begin to understand. It's why Paul writes uh, elsewhere in that same letter, actually, to the Corinthians, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for us. And yet, although we can't understand the content of the promise, the promise remains true and faithful and absolutely crucial. The reality of heaven is reality. Everything around us now, this is like a tent that we're staying in, in a temporary way. It's like a cardboard model compared with the reality. So ultimately, this is why as Christians, it's so important for us 
to have our trust in God and not in the presence. Uh, and to trust God, not just to keep us safe from death, but to keep us safe through death. Now, will he keep us safe from death? Will he keep us safe from the coronavirus? Actually, we don't know. Just as Daniel's three friends didn't know whether God would keep them safe in the furnace. But what they did know, and what we know, is that he will keep us safe through death and take us to him. Now, Father, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you that you have promised us something so very, very, very much greater than anything that we've seen or experienced in this life or anything that we ever could experience in this life. We thank you that what you have for us is something that won't even fit into our minds. And we pray that you'll open our hearts to more fully understand how great your promise is and that you'll lift our eyes above this temporary physical universe that we live in at the moment to the eternity that you have planned for us with you. In Jesus' name, amen.